Twenty years ago, Stephen Hawking, a young research student at Cambridge University, began to show the first symptoms of an incurable disease that he was told might kill him within a few years, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Undeterred, he married, had three children, and became a great scientist. His subject is cosmology, the study of the universe. some applications of Penrose's quasi-local mass construction. Um, I'll remind you, to begin with, what that construction is, because it's uh, something of a novelty. It's been around for about a year. And the way the construction works, or the way the definition works, is... The Monday seminar is more or less compulsory for all the relativity group, especially the students. Chris is in his third year. He's working on supersymmetric theories. momentum and angular momentum threading through that. Bruce is studying the early universe, and like Chris, he's writing up his PhD. Find some uh, special spinner fields on that surface, then you can track these against the curvature tensor. Wayne concentrates more on the mathematical side than on physics. He's a second year, like me, Julian. I'm working on quantum gravity. Spinner fields are like spherical harmonics, and it's like picking out some particular bits of spherical harmonic. But in special relativity, um, there are three more students, all first years which defines the matter content. To get into this group, you need a good advanced degree. So most of us are in our early 20s, except for Simon, who's only 17. One of the 10 killing vectors that you've got, so that you get the same answer integrating it over any hypersurface. So if we integrate it over a hypersurface, like so, that's the number, um, which depends on which particular killing vector I picked. And if I picked one of the translation killing vectors, that's a component of the total momentum. If I picked one of the rotation killing vectors, it's a component of angular momentum. Either way, I'll write it as a... Most of us students are under the charge of Stephen Hawking, who's the Lucasian professor of mathematics and head of the relativity now group as well. If that's special relativity. Now, if you consider linearized general relativity, if this is the source, it gives rise to a gravitational field, so you should be able to spot that momentum and angular momentum in the gravitational field. What do the self dual rotations correspond to? Oh, well, I was just. Are the combinations of boost and spatial rotation? Uh, yes, that's right. It's, you can, if it's. Uh, you think of it as a rotation in the xy plane plus i times a boost in the tz plane. 
they are just one lot of rotations. Actually, they're like no translations. Are they real? Yeah, so they're really Euclidean space, yes. but they're not going to be real here. I mean, this is uh, what one might refer to as old fashioned general relativity with uh, plus, minus, minus, minus signature. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> A guy called Stuart Dowker who's at Manchester, he's going to send a lecture down there. It's very useful. But at a more elementary level, the Gucci Gil can handsome move. Yeah. There are two different, different two in equivalency, right? Uh, that equals something of the form like this plus and chi. It's going to be self dual, then it's got to be, that's got to be true. Mm -hmm. Which, if you stick that in, it gives you F naught i. People tend to congregate from the relativity group. And at tea time, you find that you learn almost as much as you do sitting in your office working or reading. Is a choice. That equals something of the form like this plus. Right, so that one just corresponds to gauge transformation. That's what I was wondering. So therefore, then, it works for, that doesn't work for one and two. Well, he's saying that it's not, it's, it should work, you see, for any. You can do a certain amount of research, a creative thinking, each day, and then what's really helpful is discussing with other people so that your ideas are clarified. Well, why doesn't it work for five, for example? The group is quite close. Uh, we get to talk to each other about problems and have discussions all the time, which is very good in a social sense, and also in the sense that there's people here who, if you ask them a question about any particular subject, there's bound to be someone who can find an answer to it. And so you don't have to wait for very long to find an answer to something. Because you've still, because the one turn now is wrong. Three quid, I think he's gonna sue me. Because you have much greater contact with Stephen as a supervisor, because he needs your help all the time, he's always available to answer questions and to help you over things you don't understand. And he's also very, very clear in the way he explains things. And since he knows all his research students as personal friends, he seems much more relaxed and much less an academic physicist, even though he most definitely is number one, an academic physicist. The most famous of all academic physicists is Albert Einstein. The source of his fame, the general theory of relativity, burst on the world of physics in 1915. But after an initial rush of enthusiasm, few other academic physicists took up his theory and developed it further. General relativity passed out of fashion for about 40 years.
Stephen Hawking was one of a group of scientists who resurrected interest in Einstein's general theory of relativity during the 50s and 60s. Uh, Stephen worked on mathematical theorems in general relativity, which proved the necessity for a Big Bang at the beginning of the universe. He also investigated many of the attributes of a bizarre class of objects whose properties are predicted by Einstein's theory, black holes. Massive as they are, black holes are not things you can actually see because a black hole doesn't emit any light. But if a black hole passes in front of a background of stars, the stars appear to move away from their real positions just as if the black hole were a giant lens. In fact, the light from the background stars is bent round and round the black hole by its intense gravitational field so you can see several images of each star at once. If you're a long way away from a black hole, you're quite safe. If our sun were to become a black hole, We'd continue to orbit around it just as we do at the moment. In fact, it wouldn't make any difference to our orbit. But of course, we get rather cold. <laughs> But if you go close up to a black hole, then the gravitational field becomes stronger. And at a certain point, the gravitational field reaches a critical strength. And if you go beyond there, you can't get out at all, again. Stephen says that a black hole is rather like a whirlpool. Imagine you have a whirlpool and you have some little boats nearby. Far away, they're quite safe. But if they get within a certain critical distance of the whirlpool, then even if they try to motor directly away from it, they'll get sucked in by the current, which is much faster than they are. From within this critical radius, nothing, whether little boats, rays of light, or spacecraft can ever return. If it was a black hole of the mass of the sun, and then you'd be torn apart by tidal forces before you got inside the black hole. But if it was a very large black hole, such as we believe may occur in the center of our galaxy, or in quasars. Then you wouldn't see anything special if you passed inside the black hole. But once you pass a certain critical point, then you'd never be able to get out again no matter how much rocket power you used. Moreover, you would 
We assume you would run into a singularity. You would be doomed to run into a singularity. In a fairly short time. Like a few hours. <laughs> so far, even though astronomers have been busily looking for black holes, none have been definitely identified, although there are some strong candidates. So the properties of black holes have had to be entirely worked out using mathematics. If Einstein's general theory of relativity is true, then inside the radius from which nothing can escape, called the event horizon, and at the center of the black hole is a singularity, a place where gravity is infinite and space and time come to an end. It would be a very nice idea. If one could fall into a black hole and then come out in another universe. And there are some solutions of the Einstein field equations which have this property that you can come out in another universe. But all the evidence. But all the evidence we have shows that these solutions are very unstable. So that is, it. if you disturb them slightly, for example, by falling into the black hole. Then the passage which takes you through to the other universe gets closed off and you run right into the singularity. We all came out of a singularity. The Big Bang singularity at the beginning of the universe. So it wouldn't be that unnatural if we all ended up in another singularity. Either a singularity in a black hole or the collapse of the whole universe. You could say dust to dust and ashes to ashes and singularity to singularity. It can be very frustrating when you're working at something and banging your head against a wall all the time. And you're just never getting anywhere, day in, day out. But then suddenly it sort of, it clicks and you, so everything works fine for a few days. An answer comes out, whether it's what you want or what you don't want, you have to work out later. Part of it's just a search for, for beauty and prettiness in, in physics. So what do you want the particle for, Julian? Well, just to check up on how he did on one loop ventilation or something. He did it with a lamp which is rather useful. I tend to be on the more mathematical side, actually looking at equations for mathematical consistency rather than uh, physical relevance. I certainly wouldn't mind doing relativity all day, or mathematics, or anything like that.
It just interests you. There's nothing, I don't think you can explain it very well. You have to ask a psychologist about that. I mean, there's certainly no monetary reward. Well, there's a bit of monetary reward, but not much. I could be earning more on the outside. But it's very comfortable. It's that you get to do what you want to do all your life, if you get to do it all your life. You're playing games all your life. It's pretty good. All of theoretical physics is formulated in mathematical terms. A theory of physics is really a mathematical model of the world. But being good at mathematics isn't enough. One also needs what people call physical intuition. You can't, you, you can't deduce physics purely deductively from a set of basic principles. You have to make certain intuitive leaps to introduce new models. Uh, the ability to make these intuitive leaps is really what characterizes a good theoretical physicist. Stephen's lucky in that he chose one of the few fields in which his disability is not a serious handicap. Because most of his work is really just thinking. And his disabilities don't stop him doing that. In a way, they give him more time to think. In 1973, Stephen started a new line of research that was eventually to make him famous, with the discovery of Hawking radiation. Up until then, his work on black holes was concerned only with large ones, with the mass of the sun, or bigger. But then he began to think that there might also be very small black holes. Stephen realized that in order to understand them, Einstein's general relativity would not be enough he needed to use a completely different branch of physics called quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was formulated by Werner Heisenberg and Erwin Schrödinger in the mid-1920s. Theirs is a theory of very small things, like atoms. Quantum mechanics is the greatest achievement in physics this century, even greater than Einstein's general theory of relativity. It implies that what we normally think of as empty space isn't really empty at all, but is filled with pairs of particles and antiparticles. These appear together at some point in space, move apart, and then come together again, annihilating each other. They're called virtual particles because you can't directly measure them with a particle detector. You can detect them, however, by their indirect effects. According to Hawking, if there's a small black hole present, one of the members of these pairs might fall into it. Of course, the other one might fall in too, but it's also possible for one of them to escape, and in that case, it would appear to be a particle emitted from the black hole. In fact, to an observer a long way away, it appears that the black hole is emitting particles and radiation as if it were a hot body. Very small black holes aren't black at all. They shine with hawking radiation. If you have a black hole of the mass of the sun, then its temperature is only one ten millionth of a degree above absolute zero. And the amount of radiation will be absolutely insignificant. But if you have one of these small black holes, then the temperature would be much higher. And 
it would emit a lot of radiation. In fact, the most interesting mass of the black hole is about a thousand million tons. Which is about the mass of a mountain. But the actual size of such a black hole would only be that of the nucleus of an atom. But it would emit a, it would emit a lot of radiation and energy. <clears throat> equivalent to about six nuclear power stations. So if you could find such a small black hole and if you could harness it properly, then we would really solve all our energy problems. However, we have been looking for radiation from the black holes like this. We haven't found any so far. In a way, that's rather disappointing for Stephen. Because had we found one, Stephen would have got a Nobel Prize. No biscuit. Uh, yes. Well, that, that, that's actually a trivial. No, I mean, that's Instead of getting a single you are, you function, you get the difference of two Basically, what happens is you add up. I should go and buy some coffee. Oh, great. Should I buy some I think I can do that. There'll be crowds pouring in. Yeah, of course. I mean, we didn't have enough last week. It was yeah. getting a bit weak. Yeah. I think I crossed the road. That's because we had quite a many people last week. Yeah. We can't expect you. <laughs> Space. Um. Some of us are mathematicians and others physicists. And we're all working on different problems. Do you, do you want the, the omega for the embedding in the atom cylinder? These problems are usually either suggested or allocated by Stephen. These problems are very different from each other, but are basically connected in that they're all trying to unearth the fundamentals of the universe. So that's supposed to have a trace-free decorative? <laughs> Does it? <laughs> BD, BD. No, it won't, will it? It's certainly an ambitious task, and... People have been working on it for, uh, I would say, 50 years or longer. <laughs> so, I guess it's even more ambitious since we don't even know if the answer is that it can be done. <laughs> is there on the horizon, on the boundary? Yes, because R is half pi there. The prime is half pi there. So it's all right. Yes. So much for that case. <laughs> Chris.
right here. <laughs> boundaries, boundary um, petitions in that sister's place. We're trying to unify many of the modern ideas of physics. I'm interested in the um, almost philosophical or, or even religious um, quest for what actually makes the universe work. I mean, certainly, certainly the conformal group of um, corresponding to three space, to flat three space would be 041. There's an embarrassing inconsistency at the heart of modern physics. Einstein's general theory of relativity, which describes the nature of very big things, disagrees with the theory of very small things, quantum mechanics, in apparently unresolvable ways, even though no one has managed to prove either theory untrue. So perhaps the way out of this dilemma is to find a more profound theory which incorporates both. Two outstanding partial theories have been discovered this century. They are general relativity and quantum mechanics. But ultimately, we have to find one consistent theory which will describe everything. Not only general relativity and quantum mechanics, but all the other interactions in physics as well. We've had quite a success recently. And that we've developed a theory which unifies electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force. And now we want to go on to unify these interactions with gravity and also unify gravity with quantum mechanics. Unfortunately, this is a very ambitious program. That was quite a reasonable chance of success. Stephen would put, it, put the chances at 50-50. And that you could see, succeed in this task by the end of the century. Now, uh, uh, now we have a, we have a definite candidate. Now we have a definite candidate. For the complete unified theory, which will describe everything. And this candidate is called N equals 8 supergravity. If it doesn't work, then we have no idea what will work. Well, 
working very hard on this theory. But, but at the moment, it doesn't seem to predict the kind of particles that we actually observe. But we're hoping that maybe when we understand the theory better, then we could construct the particles we observe out of smaller pieces, which are the particles in the N equals A supergravity theory. And in that case, we could actually say that theoretical physics was over, we had a complete theory of the whole universe. theory of the universe. We could in principle predict everything. But in practice, the computations involved are very, very complicated. So in effect, we can't predict anything apart from the most simple situations. In fact, we already know all the laws which govern, govern all normal matter under all normal situations. So, in, in principle, we can predict everything that happens on the Earth. But we haven't had much success in predicting human behavior from mathematical equations. It's mostly complicated. A human being contains about a million, 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 million particles.
gone out to lunch with Juliet. And she's gone uh, swimming. <laughs> well, I can afford to buy myself a small white, a small black. And I can afford to buy Stephen Hall. Neither Mrs. Hawking nor their son Timmy are particularly interested in mathematics, so that when they come to lunch, we try not to talk too much about work. Oh dear, look, Stephen, that's a bit much. <laughs> white, black, black, white. Two, two white. How's that? what Stephen's going to say. So Stephen will basically be talking about infinity. <laughs> Unfortunately, infinity is rather hard to talk about because it's rather a long way away. <laughs> So what Steve's going to do is he's going to try and bring it a lot nearer. In other words, Steve's going to conformally compactify into such a space. And the Einstein statics universe is topologically S3 cross R1. Where S3 is, gives the spatial sections and R1 gives the time. So the Einstein static universe. So it's really a sort of cylinder. With the time is with the time being the long the axis. No, it just so happens that we have have the universe here. Unfortunately, we were unable to get the full four-dimensional universe in here today. <laughs> but the boundary of anti city space is a time-like hypersurface. And that really leads to an important difference. Crystal clear. It, the way he thinks, he manages to... In order to describe cut away all the dross, cut away all the trees, and just see down to the basic, simple, central fact that it's necessary to consider. Yeah. And he makes everything so crystal clear and simple. The basic uh, equation... It's quite astounding sometimes. Um, and be because he can't write, uh, because he can't, he finds it hard to read papers, hard to read books, S, he tends to... Um, Totally he thinks in terms of diagrams all the time, yes. thinks very clearly and manages to make everything very, very simple. Um. That equation is conformally invariant. It's, in the sense. It depends upon the taste of the person in the way. There's a certain taste that yeah. people have Where in which they appreciate a uh, mathematical beauty of a theory. And it's sort of hard to describe, but this is really one of the reasons for doing physics, that you find well, that there are now. just a certain number of laws, and yeah. they're very simple when it's written out mathematically, and the simplicity is quite beautiful, and the fact that it describes all around, what's all happening around us is uh, quite amazing, really. And the question is whether we can uh, keep on simplifying our laws and postulates, and 
maybe drive an ultimate life like that. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> either, other, either everyone's understood everything, <laughs> or no one's understood anything. <laughs> In the tea room, we have a number of portraits of former professors of mathematics. Uh, Stephen's not quite sure what the criterion are which determine whether you get your portrait in the tea room. But one of them seems to be that you've left the department. On the wall that this office is on. There are the portraits of Stephen's four, four immediate predecessors in the Lucasian chair. One of them was Paul Dirac, who is in fact still alive. He was one of the founders of quantum mechanics. You see, he had the idea of antimatter. In the corner, the Sir George Gabriel Stokes. He was professor for about 54 years. Because in those days, he didn't have any retirement age. There is a space outside here. In which it's fairly obvious that they'll put Stephen's portrait if he leaves. <laughs> it gives Stephen a rather creepy feeling. It's like seeing her own tombstone. To spot which, I mean, where you end up with this angular momentum twister, and to spot which bits of it are the momentum and which bits of it are the angular momentum. Because the restriction is hyperstatic, very important. You don't know what to take for that in general, because I mean, you take the thing which is that in the in the flat case.